So the next speaker is Laura, who will give a presentation about automatic generation of UMS diagrams. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for being here. Um, I want to apologize a little bit because I just went ahead and made a presentation when I saw the schedule and saw that we had plenty of time in this post session. Uh, but I assure you, it's not a long presentation and I hope it's a lightweight one. So bear with me and if not, you can blame me afterwards during the coffee break. <laughs> so well, this, I must say, is a, a degree a project from this uh, Daniel Carvalho, a student of mine, who had just presented this morning, morning in the... European time zone, and he passed with uh, good uh, grades, so that's another plus for this for this uh, work. So I'm here to talk about testing, and I can already see from your faces lighting up that this is a subject that everyone loves, right? So I will probably come up with some um, invented survey, non-existent, that will say how many developers love this kind of activity, this thing very best activity in all the, yes. <laughs> the software development cycle, isn't it? Yes. Right? <laughs> you find bugs in other people's programs. Exactly. What, what more can you? It's the perfect time. <laughs> it's the time when this complex thing that we have built comes to life and we see it working smoothly the very first time. It's, it's kind of that moment of pride when we actually deliver exactly what the client asked for in a timely manner, no making, making no mistakes ever. And, well, when we do find things, who doesn't love fixing things? I mean, it's actually an enjoyable activity, isn't it? Right? Did I get it at least a bit close to reality? No? Well, legend says that it's actually not exactly like that, because sometimes we want to really build a small thing, or a supposedly simple thing, but the whole mechanics behind it is not so simple. And of course the testing is not about what people see, but all everything that is behind that has to be tested to ensure that everything works properly. So yeah, we sometimes also build things a little bit more complex than we should. Um, sometimes when we find a leak, something that is not working, it's not only about that thing that doesn't work, it's how everything spills around it, right? So we have to fix the leak and the flooding that is caused by that uh, leak. So yeah, fixing is not always just that aspect. And there's also, also this sense of pride that we all have. So the software that we build is a little treasure. It's not nice when we are told that it's not working. And it's not nice to go over it and see, okay, this was wrong, I didn't get it right the first time. So, yeah, all those things. But all of that is nothing compared to what happens if our client gets the non-functional behavior that we wanted in the worst possible moment. Right? So that's even the worst thing of all. So, yeah, yeah. Testing is not a piece of cake for everyone. But it's like going to the doctor. We have to do it. We know we have to do it. And it's better for us if we do this. But it's better for everyone, actually, if we do it. So, with this in mind, now uh, coming back to our community, I dare say I would be bold enough to say that the Anna community has done pretty well in this recent years. Because we have a pretty populated ecosystem with lots of tools. And I'm not claiming that all the tools that exist in the Erlang world are here. But, well, I think that. There are many, they are used, they are known, so I think we can be at least moderately happy about that. Uh, from the whole ecosystem, I will focus on uh, quick check because that's the, the one the work that we've done uh, connects to. And you may be thinking, okay, quick check, but this is already so great. So what else can you do to make quick check greater? Well, yes, of course, testing with quick check is great especially when everything works, right? Because you get this whole feeling of, wow, I've tested so many things, I've run so many, so many tests just when I was getting my coffee. Yes, that's right. Uh, but we know that it's not, I mean, to get here, we know there's a lot of work involved, right? We know that the difficult things are writing the properties that produce all those dots and the models, when there are models, not only just the properties. 
and the data generators. Let's not forget about them because they are also really, really important. But for these things, again, in recent years, the research sub-community of the learning community has done a lot of things to well, try and, and help users with these tasks. So we've seen either in this very workshop or in Erlang factories and uh, Erlang user conferences uh, tools to help you build your model in a graphical way. And this is a link, so if you don't know about them, then I will post the slides afterwards and you can check those. Uh, we've seen also tools that will generate your data, uh, generate your data generators from some other description of your data that you could have. For instance, when you have a web service, then you would probably have already a description of your data and that would uh, help uh, you in writing, well, in generating the, the, the data generators uh, automatically done for you. And we've also seen, well, uh, in trying to connect the testing with the stakeholders who are maybe non-technical, some other ways of expressing those properties and models once you get them right, okay, how all the people that cannot read which or cannot read Erlang uh, can actually get to understand what is being tested. And for that, we had some tools translating those into more or less plain uh, English. So, well, that's some things that have been done, but it's not also, also it's not only about writing the properties and getting the dots. It's when we don't get the dots. It's fixing the book the bugs, or assuming they are not in the properties and the models, which also happens a lot of times, uh, then, okay, how do we, what do we do when we get to that stage? And of course, this means uh, usually uh, getting a good idea of what the counterexample that the testing tool is giving us uh, actually means in the in logic of the system or application. And again, you would say, hey, but property-based testing tools, do a nice job uh, on that also. Which, uh, that's a pretty nice thinking, right? And that's right. Uh, I will show you a little, uh, a little example that we use for one of the, well, as one of the validation uh, examples in, uh, to test our tool. So picture a forms change uh, with, well, just a way to start and stop it, activate and deactivate phone numbers, place calls between phone numbers, have the list of phones that have been activated and a little spying uh, function to know who is talking to who at a given uh, point, right? So uh, we wrote this and we planted a bug. Well, we had, as I said, uh, more examples and more uh, plant, uh, planted bugs. Then if you want to read more about them, just ask me for the extension of the paper. And so in this call we had a, a kind of nasty bug, so to say that callers with an even phone number could never call each other. So it was not straightforward, it was kind of intended so that the shrinking would not just recall, uh, uh, return a sequence of one call. And it is not trivial, I mean you will have to run more than 100 test cases to, to hit that bug, and so you get a pretty long um, sequence as an error, and as I said, and uh, that's a pretty nice job, even for this, to make it a little bit like sugar, uh, sugary like for you. It translates in this, from this kind of um, well, format to this more gold like format. And okay, well, that's, that's your original error. And as I said, the drinking process will do a really nice job most of the times. And then you will have the equivalent <coughs> here, which is yes, of course, you have to start it, activate two of, uh, even numbers, call, and then spy and see that nothing is perfect. And for most Erlang developers, this would be, well, for all of them, I hope, <laughs> that would be nice, and for most uh, coders as well. But then, what if I have to present this to a customer and say, oh, I need a week to fix this? Well, you probably don't send this you probably don't send pieces of your code to your client. So what you would send is that it would be this. So this is what our tool produces from the shrinking, uh, from the, the counter example that it produces. So it's actually, so we uh, get the information from WikCheck in the format that WikCheck uh, stores the counter examples and we find that 
what actors are involved in the sequence, what messages do uh, they uh, exchange, whether or not they create additional things. Like, uh, well, this is probably a bit, uh, a bit too much for this simple comp uh, example, but you could be creating another, in this case it's a piece of data, but it could be spawning another process, so that's also uh, detected and represented. And what well, the activations and everything that you would expect in a in a informative uh, UML sequence diagram. So that's more or less uh, the presentation of the tool. It's just very briefly to give you an idea that this is not like really bounded into quick check. We have several stages. Of course, the first one uh, has to do with extracting the information from whatever, whatever we may get it at the time is quick check. But if, if we had a similar thing coming from other tools. Well, the first stage is translated that into an abstract intermediate format so that we can work with it and we don't depend on that format changing in the future, which is also likely even if you stick with one uh, tool. So once we have the, the counter example information in an intermediate uh, format, we use that format to find that information I was mentioning there. Well, the actors, the functions, the values involved, whenever values are reused or not. Uh, and so we, we create what the sequence is in, the, in, another, in our own format from that uh, abstract uh, uh, representation of the counter example. And then again, so that we don't depend on the output tool, we, uh, we don't generate that uh, directly. That's the reason why we have that. And then once we have the, the UML sequence, in that abstract format, we translate it into whatever we want uh, to print it. And in this case, we are using Plant UML, that is an open source tool that is test based. So you just write text which is really readable for humans, even. And then uh, the tool translates that into this very nice format. And it outputs PNG and SVG, I think. And it's in beta, uh, except in XML, but we haven't tested with the XML, only with the plain text representation. And well, that's more or less what we have done. We have more ideas, so if I, if I get more students, I will probably uh, ask them to extend this. So well, yeah, we tested a few examples. So I showed you the one with the fonts change. We have another one which is an editor. So we, you can insert or overwrite text uh, from a given position. And of course, it's different if you are inserting or overwriting. So and we planted a few bugs there too, and, and got really nice thinking well, and also really nice uh, UMS sequences looking uh, very, very varied. But if you have really long sequences, really complex that you will uh, like to see uh, in this format, please contact me because that would be also very nice for us. And then there's a whole lot of things that are around well, in the quick check uh, environment that we would actually see. So we've tested with models <coughs> that, with the counter example produced by models and properties, let's take full models and, and, and plain properties, but we haven't tested with uh, counter examples involving models that use mocks or components. So I don't know if there would be some other additional information in those cases that would be useful, so that's something also to explore. And there's also this thing here, that yes, at the moment we can detect if some other object or agent appears because it's as a result of, of some previous interaction. But we don't really know, maybe, or likely, this call will make these two uh, actors do something among each other. And that's not in, an information that we can get from the counter example. So a bit more ambitious would be not just start with the counter example information, but also to get some information from the execution to see if we get some more some, something else out of there that we can also present on the UML sequence that will be representing that behind the scenes thing. That will also very uh, be very very helpful for for debugging for sure. And then lastly, because Plant UML is so convenient to use, being that if that the, the format is plain text, it's also very convenient to write uh, stateful representations of components. We actually built a stateful diagram 
representing the editor that we were using as an example. So at some point we just thought, oh, we have this very cute, small representation of the state that uh, is the business logic of this, this component. If we could have this test translated into the, the quick check stateful uh, model, we wouldn't have to write it. So that's another, that's another thing that we have in mind. And well, as I said, that's the, the link to the big bucket repository, what the tool and the examples are. And if you want the longer version with the explanation of the bugs we, we planted and, and a bit more of technical information, you just ask me and I will happily provide it. And that's it. to the diagram that you generated? Yes, this one. So you say that comes from the counter example. How, how does one tool know that 24 and 20 yes. uh, are resources that are being created at that point? Well, in, we assume that everything that uh, appears during the execution is potentially an actor. So there will be cases in which they don't do anything. So, okay, they probably are just data. But if we could see that's what I was saying, that it would be interesting to have more information that the, just the plain counterexample sequence doesn't give you. Because if they, as a result of this, something else is called here, then you will, act, you will immediately see that these are not just passive data. That those are actors that are doing something else. But we cannot know that from the counterexample sequence. So if the counterexample had included deactivate, would that also yes. be in that display case, of creating yes. something? Exactly, yeah. Mm. In that case, you will see that on the sequence. Yes. Mm. You might be able to get this information from the model, in fact. Because when you activate 24, then 24 yeah. is going to appear in the model state. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we, we would... I hope I... Um, I would prefer mm, to avoid inspecting the model if I, if I could, but maybe doing that is easier than, than getting information from the runtime period of the, of the test. Well, I think mean, they're both useful sources, sources sure, of information, sure. and the model is actually yeah. more abstract, so Yes, yes, the thing with the model is that it may depend on who wrote it, the yeah, style sure. of the model, yeah. so. And then from the traces that you get from the virtual machine, you know what is to expect. So maybe for a concurrency error, what you would like to see is like all the scenarios that are yeah. that are possible, that and, and that you as user need to decide which ones are not allowed or which ones are. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if which gives you more than one counter example for in that those cases. No, but you can imagine getting a counter example where the person forks to two people. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which would be kind of <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that would be a nice thing to detect and we Yes. So, would you ever get more than one line like the centralita? Is that the? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Centralita is the Spanish word for function. Okay. So uh, you get yeah. If you, of if you, I mean, that's why I wanted to to. Well, that's why I added one of the feature lines working with components because then you will have. Mm -hmm. Like more one main thing that you interact with, and not just like one main thing and the things that appear afterwards as a result of, of your interaction. What's the other testing tools? So, like, do you think that you can get the same information from any tool? 
innate or because then usually you have something like okay it's failed yeah. then you have the test case which is failed and it's not via counterexample that how can you no it's actually more like what you expected and what you want yeah because then, at least with the e unit i mean there's not a lot of stateful things that you can testing that you can write um, still uh, with e unit even though it's not very well documented there's a listener that you can like tune to so it will give you information during the execu uh, the execution of the test so maybe doing that same as uh, we were saying that you could get some information about what happens in the middle from the time that you actually place the goal and the actual the time that you get the result and that maybe would be uh, useful to represent as a sequence like but in that case, definitely we will we'll need to get the information during the execution of the tool and not only after. And then for other tools like uh, proper, for instance, I'm very positive that you, we could get equivalent information. It's only a matter of adjusting that first step there.